door. See ya. Now, my next guest is the Liberals' youngest senator, and he has big ideas on how to change Australia. He recently made his maiden speech in the Senate, and he certainly stood out for his youthfulness. Tonight, I've laid down the markers which I will one day judge my own contribution by. I hope that I can live up to them. If I am ever lost for direction, I will remind myself of President Calvin Coolidge's measure of his own time in office. Perhaps one of the most important accomplishments of my administration has been minding my own business. I thank the Senate for the courtesy it has extended me this evening. Senator James Patterson, welcome. Thank you, Patricia. Pleased to be with you. Well, let's get to the, the big issue of the day. Former Prime Minister uh, Tony Abbott will campaign in marginal seats because he doesn't have an official role in the campaign. What do you think his role should be? Well, like any former Prime Minister, I think he's got a lot to contribute to the election campaign. I hope that he'll be out there in his own seat and in other seats across the country uh, supporting Liberal candidates, raising money and, and supporting the cause. I have to say I was very amused to see uh, John Hewson giving advice uh, to Tony Abbott. He's probably the last person I would be calling for advice for how to behave as a former Liberal leader. I hope Tony hasn't taken any of his advice to heart. I think the real template here is former Prime Minister John Howard, who has really shown what a distinguished former Prime Minister can do. But he left Parliament. So so should then Tony Abbott leave Parliament? That's what John Howard did. That's how he's assisted. Well, as you know, John Howard didn't have any choice in that matter. No, he didn't. Um, I think Tony Abbott's very welcome in Parliament, and if he'd like to continue to make a contribution there, then we'd be very happy to have him. I certainly would be happy to have him. Um, and he should make a best the best contribution he thinks is appropriate for him. Uh, if that's in Parliament, great. You remember that famous picture of the, last, of, the, of the 2010 election campaign, Julia Gillard looking at Queensland maps. Do you remember that picture? Do, it's such an iconic picture with Kevin Rudd. The reason they took that picture was there was a crisis. They hadn't figured out a role for Kevin Rudd. They realised they needed to include him in the campaign, so they took that picture and it was actually a public relations disaster for them because it was such an uncomfortable relationship. You don't want to get to the point during the campaign when you have that kind of moment either, though, do you? No, of course not, and I don't see any reason why we would get to that point. I think uh, the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, is, is leading a great government um, which is in a very strong position uh, and will be seeking the man a mandate from the Australian people uh, in due course to be re-elected and Tony Abbott has a role to play as, as a member of the team there. Um, it was clear that Julie Gillard have, had a very shaky hold on the leadership and she needed to be seen to be appealing to Kevin Rudd and his supporters. I don't think the Prime Minister is in the same position today. Okay, but, but on that issue, you heard what Nick Xenophon said there, pretty cheeky, very Nick Xenophon, the whole thing really, but come to South Australia, Tony Abbott, campaign. Now, what he's saying there, of course, is that Tony Abbott's unpopular and it, it reminds the public in marginal seats about Tony Abbott and that actually he works against the government. Is that true? I'm not sure that's right. I haven't detected uh, any evidence of that. I certainly have never met a voter who said that they're not going to be voting for Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull because Tony Abbott used to be Prime Minister. Uh, I don't think voters think that way. I think voters will make a decision on who's the best Prime Minister between Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten. And that's a comparison that I know the Liberal Party relishes. So they shouldn't, he shouldn't be given Tony Abbott a special role in the campaign, a special no more special role than he, than he naturally already has as a former Prime Minister and a respected uh, elder statesman of our party. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of MPs who'll be keen to have his support and I'm sure he'll be keen to give it. On Cory Bernardi's uh, move, this, this pretty interesting move really, to launch a new political force, the Australian Conservatives, to give a voice back to the forgotten people, what do you make of that? Does that potentially split the Conservatives? Well, I'm not quite sure yet exactly what Corey has in mind, but Corey has been a real uh, activist and, and entrepreneur in a political sense uh, for many years. He's established the Conservative Leadership Foundation, which does great work in mentoring and supporting uh, young people who want to be involved in politics. Um, this may well be just an extension of that. I think um, that Corey's got a lot to contribute to the Liberal Party uh, and, and, and represents a significant proportion of opinion within the Liberal Party. So you're concerned, though, if it becomes more than that? You're saying you're not sure at this stage? No, I wouldn't say that I'm concerned. I, I think Corey's been a great contributor. I know he will continue to be a great contributor to the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party is at its best when the Liberal and Conservative strands, intellectual traditions are really well represented. Uh, Corey clearly represents very powerfully one of those traditions. and uh, We need people like Corey in the Liberal Party contributing to that. And on that other big story of the week, weekend, which was in the Weekend Australian, about the gay marriage plebiscite being kicked off to after the election, in terms of the details. Is that a problem? Do, do you need to be able to tell the public what they're going to be voting for, how it's going to look before you go to the election? 
I think it's pretty clear to the public that if they re-elect a coalition government, there will be a plebiscite as soon as practically possible on same-sex marriage. Uh, the details will be worked out, but this is really, we're talking about details here like public funding and the exact nature of the question. I think the public understand the key issue and the key choice here is, do you want to have a public vote? Um, polls indicate that they certainly do, and the only party offering them that is the coalition. Now, on your maiden speech, we haven't got a lot of time left, but you, you gave a really interesting maiden speech. I heard you speaking to David Spears this week about it too. Uh, a lot of interesting issues raised, moving uh, an embassy, uh, of course, in Israel was one of the contentious points. You also said that you reserve the right to cross the floor on contentious issues that you're passionate about. What sort of issues might they be? Well, I hope I never have to. Yeah. I hope I'm always able to persuade what my would colleagues they be? to What's, agree with what, you. What are you the most passionate about? Is it, you know, your former IPA? What are the things that you would cross the floor over? Well, it's hard to say for sure in advance exactly what they would be, but one good historical example, I think, where uh, Liberals chose to cross the floor was the emissions trading scheme debate in 2009. Uh, a number of them resigned from the front bench to do so. And I think that demonstrated good political judgment and also good policy judgment by doing so. Uh, the Liberal Party changed its position and, and went on to defeat uh, Kevin Rudd's ETS and, and defeat the Rudd and Gillard governments. Uh, so that's a good historical example where I think it was justified, but it is something that should be used very sparingly. And what do you say to people who say you're too young, uh, you're all coming from the IPA? Now, that's another big common criticism of Liberal Party pre-selection, the Institute of Public Affairs. What would you say to your critics who say you have no life experience? Well, that must be a recent criticism because it's really only myself and Tim Wilson at the federal level who've been pre-selected. It is. Pre I've heard it in the last the two weeks. Good, good. Well, I'm pleased to hear that. It's fresh. I, I think um, I think people from a uh, think tank, a free market think tank, have a lot to contribute that is different. Uh, we're not lawyers. We're not political staffers. We're not business people. Uh, we're people who worked in the policy space and in, in, the, in the battle of ideas our whole professional careers. So myself and my, my friend and former colleague Tim Wilson, I think, will have a lot to contribute. But ultimately, that's for the public to judge and that's for the party to judge. If they don't believe we're doing a good job, We'll hear about it. Do you think it's important, though, that young people, you are also very young, are represented, that it's, well, it's ageist to suggest that young people can't be good MPs or good senators? Well, young people are looking for political parties that represent them and stand up for them and understand the issues that are important to them. And one of the ways the Liberal Party can demonstrate that it does that is by pre-selecting younger MPs, and I hope in a small way I'm able to do that. If the young people ever look at the Liberal Party and see that it doesn't look or reflect their values or their interests, then we're going to have difficulty earning their votes. So um, I hope I'm able to contribute to that. James, thanks so much for coming in on an Easter Sunday. Thank you, Patricia. It's been a Appreciate pleasure that. to talk to you.